Yeah. Uh, good evening, everybody. This is Brendan Baylod uh, from the Great Lakes Shipwreck Research Group, and we're here tonight with another episode of uh, Great Lakes Shipwrecks Live. Um, <laughs> We'll give it a couple of minutes for people to start joining. Um, we've got a special guest tonight, a guy that uh, I've known for many years and I'm really glad to, to have on the show. Um, if you're on uh, and joining us, I'd appreciate if you'd uh, make a couple of comments in the uh, comments area so we know that you're, uh, that you're watching. We've got a great show in store for you tonight, uh, a really interesting topic, one that uh, I'm looking forward to learning about. And one that's been getting a lot of attention lately in uh, Great Lakes shipwreck circles, uh, photogrammetry. Um, looks like we've got some people joining already. Looks good. Um, got a couple of people uh, joining us. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, thanks for getting on. We'll let a couple other people join before we get rolling. Um, I've got a little bit of housekeeping to do um, before we uh, before we get rolling. There we've got some people joining now. Um, we have uh, a couple of shows lined up now. Uh, we've got a couple of guests coming on in the in the near future. Um, but uh, I've only got one of them I can announce yet. But they're also there's some really great guests. Um, next week's guest is an award-winning and uh, world-renowned underwater photographer, uh, Becky Kagenshot. And I've been wanting to get back here on the show for quite some time. She's uh, really well known for just some stunning underwater uh, uh, photos of shipwrecks on the Great Lakes. And um, we're going to uh, learn about Becky and her work and kind of how she got into this and uh, see some of, uh, some of the amazing stuff that she's done over the course of her, frankly, already pretty long career. So um, great guest uh, for next week. Join us. Uh, you won't want to miss Becky. She uh, is one of the best underwater photographers on the Great Lakes. A um, couple other housekeeping things. Uh, I'd like to thank all the new, welcome all the new people that have joined the Great Lakes Shipwreck Research Group. We seem to be holding steady at around 3,500 members. Um, and uh, I'd like to thank everybody for who's posted all the neat uh, uh, original content on the group. We really appreciate those posts. I'd just like to remind everybody that it is the Great Lakes Shipwreck Research Group, and we do want uh, you know sort of newer, interesting content um not your dive trip photos uh you know to the tourist tracks that everyone's been on and seen a lot of um but if you do have if you do want to post your pictures of, of a wreck that you've been on tell us a little bit about the history of the ship and you know uh, what's significant about it so we appreciate that always so why don't we get started uh tonight i have a really special guest uh ken merriman uh ken and i have uh, known each other for quite some time and Ken is a pioneer in many different areas on the Great Lakes, uh, in Great Lakes maritime history, Great Lakes shipwreck diving. There's a little too much to, to, to cover, I guess. And I'm, this isn't going to be our normal sort of this is your life, you know, retrospective show uh, for a couple of reasons, mostly because I, I, for some reason I suspect a lot of Ken's accomplishments still are, are yet ahead of him. So, uh, so. <laughs> no need to retrospect with, uh, with Ken Merriman. Um, but then also, uh, Ken has an amazing project, and I, I made a post about it on the group last week to kind of give a little teaser about this, and uh, Ken is a, a pioneer, really, in the science slash art of photogrammetry and its use for documenting Great Lakes shipwrecks, and that's really what this show is going to be about tonight. We've had so many uh, questions about it, about photogrammetry, and uh, and people just love it when I post Ken's models on the on the group. So I thought, what a what better way to uh, have uh, to learn about it than to have uh, Ken come on himself. So welcome to the show, Ken. Well, thank you, thank yeah, you for having you. me. I'm honored to to share share our our stuff. So well, thank you for uh, agreeing to be on. So. Uh, just want to remind everybody before we uh, we dive in, uh, don't forget, uh, we have a Zoom room. It's posted on the board. Um, Ken's going to be there to answer your questions. So uh, you can either you can answer the ask questions in the chat if you want, or you can wait until the Zoom room and ask them of Ken himself. So without further ado, uh, I uh, Ken has prepared some material, and we're going to uh, show you some uh, just some stunning stuff tonight. But Ken... Uh, I'm gonna throw some stuff up here on the screen and and, and get some some of our stuff uh, queued up for for our dog and pony show here. So if you guys will bear with me, just take a second. 
All right. So Ken, um, the, the main question I had uh, is, uh, you know, uh, what is uh, photogrammetry for shipwrecks? How did you learn about it? And, um, you know, uh, uh, tell us how you got interested in this. Okay. Um, let me, hopefully this starts out all right here. So are you seeing that now? You bet. Okay. Uh, well, so a little background. Um, when I I moved to Minnesota back in 71 and uh, I went to engineering school in Cleveland, I grew up in Ohio, and I bought this old boat, this 1947 Owens Cruiser, uh, with dreams of uh, cruising through the Great Lakes to Florida with it. Uh, I was not happy with my job at 71. You know, their jobs weren't plentiful. But anyways, that was when gas was 39 cents a gallon or 29 cents a gallon. And and uh, I was had a, had a good job. And anyways, uh, I uh, by the time I bought this old boat that uh, was a basket case when I bought it and and by the time I got it fixed up a year later, gas had jumped to to 45 cents a gallon, which, <laughs> you know, I know that sounds low but uh it kind of put a put a squelch on the idea of cruising through the great lakes uh, i met my wife and job my job got better so anyways i ended up uh with this boat on lake superior and uh started meeting friends and uh taking people out diving i i you know i started diving in 67 i i was one of the generation that watched sea hunt and jacques Cousteau and when I graduated from high school, the first 50 bucks I made, uh, I slapped down on the counter and said, I want to scuba dive. So, um, and I've never looked back. I've enjoyed the sport for 50, 50, uh, let's see, 67, 50, 55 years now. That's how old I am. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> now you're making me think maybe I'm not, and my best accomplishments are not ahead of me. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, anyways, um, the uh, you know we were I was taking people out and kind of eventually you know I met this fellow Ken Knudsen who who he you know he liked to talk to people and he'd tell them we had this boat to go out diving and. Basically, I was taking people out that I didn't know, so uh, I thought, well, maybe I better get a license to do this, and and so they'd evolved into a into a forty year business of running scuba charters, uh, which I slowly uh, precipitated to Isle Royal and uh, um, ran most of my charters to Isle Royal, and it was always just a hobby business. Um, and then uh, in 2016, I retired, and I retired. I retired from my engineering job, and I retired from running scuba charters, and uh, decided to circumnavigate the Great Lakes with my boat. Because you know, when you run charters, you're kind of stuck in one place, and and uh, I always wanted to see more of the Great Lakes. And so, for the last five years, uh, these are the routes I've been kind of where I've been on the Great Lakes. And uh, we've put probably about 14,000 miles roughly on uh, in that uh, four year or, or five years. And uh, and I'm still not home yet. So uh, <laughs> boat's down in Ohio right now. So, so anyway, so, you know, you ask what photogrammetry is. That, that's kind of my background, how I got here. Um, we, you know, Jerry Elias and I like to hunt for shipwrecks and, and, uh, Jerry was the one that actually first started, you know, looking into photogrammetry and these were our first things we did. Um, you know, we, we shot pictures, you know, the wrecks we found with the drop camera and the Strathmore and some of the other ones I shot, I, I would shoot the, the video and then Jerry would try to process them. And then I slowly got into it around 
2006, 17, probably I started processing the stuff myself. I think I, I think I played with it in 16, but I never really got heavily into it till later. Um, and these are, you know, these are the ones that, uh, uh, some of the ones that we did. Um, and it's been a, you know, a trial and error. We didn't take any, we have never been trained. Uh, we learned from our failures and, you know, that turned into that. And, you know, this is, you know, this is the barge industry that, that Brendan and, and I found this year. Um, and, you know, it was a mess and I, you know, cleaned it up, got it looking decent, halfway decent. Um, but yeah, basically the models, you know, this is what the final thing is, but you know, when I start, when you start with it, it's kind of a mess. So, so anyways, so what is photogrammetry? Um, and in simple terms, photogrammetry is the science of making measurements from photographs. And it's based on your lens, um, you know, your your lens focal length and and the size of the object on your image plane. And then if you know the distance or you, you can estimate the distance from the lens, you can figure out the size in the in the scene. And so we when we call it photogrammetry, we're really kind of, it's probably not quite the right name for it. It's really what we're doing is structure, structure for motion. And that's what most archeologists, you know, are using now. And you shoot overlapping images and you load them into the computer and the software picks out key points in the images and then it can correlate those, you know, to the next image uh, until it builds up a, a point cloud, a sparse point cloud. Uh, for example, here's that tug sport. And these are the key points, those feature points. The blue ones means that he's found a match on the next image. And, and these are, uh, you know, it, these are two successive images. And those lines are kind of where he's done matching. And uh, and from that, he can figure out the, the camera positions, believe it or not. And he you get a he can create a sparse point cloud wherever he has, you know, multiple cameras that are seeing the same point. And for example, this one is 70,000 points. Uh, then you go through a process called densification or where it uses another algorithm, makes that point cloud more dense. Uh, this is 84 million points in this one. And then, then you build a mesh, you connect the points into a mesh. This is a close up. you can see these little triangles, uh, but this is around 8 million triangles. Uh, and that's what it looks. And then you put a texture on it and then it looks like that. Wow. So that's kind of how you go through the process um to, to process that that's kind of what photogrammetry is that blows my mind um you were explaining this to me over the summer when we were together and i guess i didn't quite get how technically complex this is um can uh like what what equipment do you use for this and how do you how what do you need to do to to to, to make this to do this work Okay, so so it's not you know it's not as complex as you might think. I mean, it, you run a piece of software on a computer, and, and having a somewhat powerful computer is good. You know, it, it goes much faster. Um, but uh, you know, you need a camera, of course, and uh, you can you know you can do it with an SLR. You can do it with a a uh, cell phone. You can do it with a GoPro. You can put multiple GoPros on a on a light on a bar with lights. Now this is Tim Pronky. Uh, he, he to get uh, away from some of the lighting problems he had. He was he shot the Madeira uh, at night uh, with lights. And if you got a lot of money, you can like the Park Service. You can put three um, uh, mirrorless uh, Nikon's on a on a framework and put it on a scooter and then you know they do that so that they can have very high resolution uh, lots of overlap and cover big areas with it 
and uh, and then they ride around on a scooter. You know, if you've been to Isle Royale, the um, you know the Glen Lion is a, a massive wreckage area, and and having it on a scooter is uh, is good. But basically, you swim around the wreck and you shoot pictures. Uh, you know, these are kind of the passes I like to do. Um, you know, I, I like to shoot a pass at a, at a 45, like on the corner of the wreck uh, around the the, the uh, bulwark. And then uh, I shoot a couple passes down the deck. And if the thing sits up high out of the, you know, above the bottom, sometimes you need to shoot a pass uh, to shoot the sides. And this is... If you imagine that each one of these, uh, the blue, all these, the blue things, each one of those is an image. That's about, I think that one's about 2,000 images. Uh, and, you know, you can do this with video and then do frame captures, and that works. Um, I put my camera on time lapse, and then uh, I just swim, and it takes a, a picture every second and uh, uh, and then I swim around the wreck and when I turn I, I have it set up so that I when I hit my shutter uh, button it'll shoot three frames a second uh, for a short burst and because when you pan you kind of you can kind of lose the overlap that you need to to do the models but uh, but yeah you those are trails around the wreck and uh, uh, these these are lighting. If you're you know if you're starting, I think natural lighting is the best. And you know these shallow wrecks are are easy to do. You know there's if you have a lot of the you know the light rippling effects that can be a little bit of a problem. But I I didn't have that on these wrecks. Um, but you know let me just swim around the wrecks and. Uh, that's natural lighting. We also you can do with uh, um, this. This one I did was uh, totally artificial light, uh, and this not only was artificial light, it was in about eight to ten foot of visibility. So I was shooting about five or six foot from the wreck, and uh, we actually made three loops around this one. This is a uh, called the Hopkins. It's a it's a, an old uh, passenger boat in one of the uh, lakes around Minneapolis, uh, Lake Minnetonka, and these are very historic wrecks. So, um, so anyways, uh, that's you know that's kind of in a nutshell how you do it. So, Ken, do you own stock in Sandisk? <laughs> well, actually, I probably would be better to to own stock in Western Digital because uh, <laughs> I think I've got uh, I have about fifty terabytes of uh, of, uh, of of hard drive on between my two computers, and uh, yeah, it's at least fifty. It might be sixty now because I just bought it about twenty five more terabytes this winter. Oh, that's folks. So. Yeah, it, it's well, you know, I'm I did I shot about what was it, uh, 20 or 30 wrecks this summer, uh, to process. Uh, not all of them worked. Um, uh, you know, this was kind of a learning process for us, so, um, so yeah, so it was, yeah, I've got a, I, I've got a lot of hard drive space and uh. <laughs> Well, tell us more about it. How does how does how do they get how does the computer do this? And uh, is that do you do you have to run this on your desktop? Can you run it up in the cloud? Uh, I've never quite understood that about photogrammetry. Okay, so you can do. So I'm going to see. I don't remember where I was going to talk about the quality, but go ahead, go ahead. Well, it okay. So uh, to to do it, these are all the things that are good to have: good diving skills, good image quality that's important good overlap in your pictures good coverage and good resolution um you know good 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 this is my camera that i use um uh why don't i finish this and then we'll talk ahead, about yeah. Yeah. the computer so yeah. so you can you know if if you've been shooting video you know for a while um or you've shot photo mosaics 
in the past, you can actually repurpose that video and make a 3D model. All of these wrecks were photo mosaics that, uh, and, and the upper left and lower right I shot in 1999 with standard definition video. And then I upscaled it and made 3D models out of it. And then the lower left and upper right were shot with uh, high def video, but they were just photo mosaics. But they have relief and you can see the relief. Um, and then I also have some, some wrecks, I've just covered them very thoroughly and uh and i managed to make a model they aren't always perfect um but uh you know like the uh, silver lake in the upper left corner uh you know we had 100 and some foot of visibility on it and so it wasn't difficult to you know i was shooting the thing with video and to stay out away from it a ways and and basically i got pretty much the whole thing so uh, the one on in the upper right. I love side wheelers, uh, so the other three are side wheelers, and I, I've been kind of working towards doing a, kind of a mini documentary on Great Lakes side wheelers, and, uh, and I want to animate a, a walking beam steam engine. But uh, cool. so I've been doing, uh, I, I was shooting these very thoroughly, especially the engines so i can build a model of them so so the side wheelers i tend to have that i've dived i tend to have uh, enough video to make something of a model and then this is our website that we're going to talk about in a while and uh, okay so there now i'm done with that and we can talk about so 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 as far as the computer goes uh i'm gonna close this so um all right, you still there? Okay, there you are. You still there? And you bet I am. Okay, all right. Um, so, so I bought a a fairly powerful computer. Uh, it became obvious. We started out. Jerry bought 3D Zephyr, and as far as performance goes, that used to be kind of the dog. Uh, I mean, Jerry would run things two weeks and uh it's gotten much better uh now um uh, but uh so 3d zephyr is photogrammetry processing software correct yes there's it runs on your desktop yes you can well you can run it on a desktop you can run it on a laptop um gotcha. it takes a bit of memory uh and and some processing power um if you have a good video card that's uh, a plus uh, what I did is, you know, I got uh, Agis. Agisoft is kind of the industry standard uh, that people use, and that's I started down that path. Uh, I, I've worked with, you know, software for a long time, and I, I found that, you know, sticking with the, the uh, standard one, the one that everybody uses, is usually a good thing to do. Um, so anyways, uh, I got the the uh, Agisoft and and believe it or not, you can get the standard version, which all of the models that uh, I did, you know, on our website, I didn't I haven't done all those. Those are people are contributing those. So so some are mine and some are not. Um, but all of those were done with standard the standard software. Uh, and that it's like 180 bucks, 200 bucks. It's under $200. Uh, Where do you get it from? Can you just download it and pay? Uh, yes, you download it. Uh, if you just do a search on Agisoft, Metashape is the name of the software. Just do a search on it. Uh, you'll find it. And and uh, you, you can do a 30-day free trial for the, uh, you know, for the professional or the uh, standard version. Professional has control points, which, you know, if you have a trouble knitting, um, knitting things together, uh, you can, you can kind of manually nudge it and say, all right, this point in this picture is the same as this point in this picture. And then the software knows to, you know, that the, that's the, it puts it together like that. Um, so, and I thought it was going to be a big plus 
for what I was doing. And I, I do have some that I'm sure will, will get better, but, uh, most of what I've been doing is, is, uh, techniques that I've learned as I've processed, I've done, I processed around 60 of these things. So, and, uh, you know, each one comes with its challenge, but, uh, um, but yeah, I still plan on on using that uh, uh, the control points. We talked about the peninsula, um, which is a little steamer that was that's in Eagle Harbor, and uh, Randy BB gave me some footage that he shot in two thousand. I think it was two thousand one. Yeah, a long time ago. Yeah, and it was runs my mind. It was on a VHS tape, if I remember right, or something. Anyways, uh, yeah, it's it's working. Um, it's just, you know, he, what he was covering the thing to just kind of document it because it's one of the wrecks that gets covered with sand and then it gets uncovered. And he, you and him hit it in a weekend where it had it was uncovered. Yeah. And uh, so he shot this stuff and uh, and it's a historic wreck. And so I. I've been, I spent a lot of time on that one. So <laughs> trying to get that one to work. Uh, and uh, yeah, like I say, it'll go along and, you know, basically there's not a lot of overlap between passes. So it's just kind of, you know, as you, as he's swimming, you can get kind of a line of uh, a side of the wreck or whatever, you know, and, and when he jerks or pans sideways, I lose the the overlap, so I have to go back and grab more frames out of the video, and then I can make it. So it's been a kind of a uh, tedious process to make that one, get that one together. And I, I, I've got several that are like that that I've been got. I think uh, I'll show you in a sure uh, what we get later. But the uh, Keystone State is one is a wreck that I just really, really like. Uh, uh, but it's been boy, that's been a pain. I've, I've got probably a hundred hours in on that one. So. Wow. So Ken, one question I have that I don't know if you know the answer to this. I've heard people talk about uploading this stuff and processing it in the cloud, as opposed to doing it locally. Do you know anything about that? Yeah, you can. Um, so I've never done it. Um, you can. Um, you can pay. So so Reality Capture had. So there's three three so, uh, three pieces of software that that I'm familiar with and have tried. Uh, 3D Zephyr, um, Agisoft Metashape, and Reality Capture. Uh, the Park Service started with Agisoft, then they went to Reality Capture, and I think they're back to Agisoft now. Um, Reality Capture was really fast, but it uh, it it left, it, it would, you'd end up with a bunch of pieces that you had to knit together. Um, that one had kind of a unique um, uh, pricing. You could download the software, play with it all you want, and then when you wanted to export the final model, you paid by how many photos it you know it had it used, nice. which was kind of cool. You could learn a lot that way, and uh, I they may have backed away from that because last time I tried to run mine, uh, it, it didn't work. Um, uh, and I'm pretty sure Agisoft, you can, you can do it in the cloud too. I've just never done that. Uh, like say reality capture, that was kind of part of their thing that you could do it in the cloud and there was one price to do it that way. And then there was another price to, to do it on your own processor. Uh, and Zephyr, I'm not sure if Zephyr you can do in the cloud or not. Um, yeah, the reason I ask is it just seemed like I'd heard that, you know, it is pricey to get a, a, a powerful laptop, but it seemed like it may be a poor man's uh, sort of way to do it if you could, you know, send it up to the cloud. But yeah. anyway, thanks for answering that. Yeah, I think I've, I, so I've got, the, the one that I do this on is the, uh, I've got a, let's say a pretty powerful computer. I think I spent about 20 I think I've probably got about 23, 2400 in it now. Um, it's, I mean, it's not terrible, um, uh, but it's an i9, you know, 16 core i9, and I've got a good uh, a video card. Part, some of the, you know, it, there's multiple steps in the process. So 
some of the steps use the video card and some use the processing. And when I, I went through and I ran some tests and watched the um, the uh, uh, performance meter monitoring stuff to see, you know, sh should I buy a video card or should I buy an i9 instead of an i7, you know, uh, but uh, turned out about half the processes ran on the, your CPUs and about half of them ran on the GPUs. So mm -hmm. you could speed up one and you'd still only gain half. So, <laughs> so I ended up getting both. And, and uh, so, and it, you know, if you want to run big, big things, you, your video card needs a, I think mine has eight gigabytes of uh, memory. Uh, the, uh, and I've, I've got 64 gig of RAM, which has wow pretty good. So I, I didn't I didn't go up to the 128, and uh, but uh, it's I, I so far that I haven't hit a limit on that. Uh, but but now you know we've we haven't done wrecks that are you know four or five hundred feet long. It's more than I can swim. <laughs> so, <laughs> so. Not gonna do the Cedarville anytime soon, are you? Well, I'm planning on buying a scooter to this before the next season. Uh, not necessarily to do the Cedarville, but uh, I found about 200 to two. So it depends on the depth. You know, a 200 foot wreck is about the limit I can swim. Yeah. You know, uh, if they're deeper, you know, uh, it's, it, it takes two of us to do it. Um, yeah. But, uh, yeah, the the Clifton is in is 300 foot long, and it's sitting, you know, it's not buried into the bottom. <clears throat> so you have it's on its side, and you've kind of got the full um, full width of the ship high, so that it's a lot of area to cover. And uh, so uh, definitely need a scooter for that one, or a lot of people shooting pictures. So. so can, it, um why don't you uh, talk a little bit about the uh, the database and show us uh, the project? Uh, there's a that's an amazing project. I I kind of when you first were telling me about it, I sort of thought it was a kind of a pie in the sky sort of thing, but it's really come together, and uh, I, I'm really impressed with what you've done. Well, thank you. Um, okay, let me uh, here. All right. It's not just that, that Ken has all these models up there, which he does. Uh, it's the background information on the vessels. It's really, uh, really impressive, and it's a great start. I mean, this could become the beginning of something huge, where we try to do, you know, really all the major diveable or historically important sites on the Great Lakes. Oh, oh, absolutely. That's that's the plan. Um, okay, so I uh, are you seeing this or? Not yet. You have to share. You're not sharing yet that I can see. Okay, so I gotta I gotta go back here and share there we go uh, okay so all right i guess i got to do this share and then here we go get over here are we sharing now are we we are sharing ken i'm gonna okay let's roll so so this is our website it's called 3dshipwrecks.org um and our mission is on the, on the first page, uh, and it is to create a 3D model of every Great Lake shipwreck. Now, um, we're not saying we, this is a GLSBS project, but our goal is to create a database for these models. And what we wanna do is work with, the diving community, uh, shipwreck preservation organizations, uh, uh, just interested divers, anybody who wants that thinks this is cool and wants to do it. And it's it's really fun. You know, I I I love shooting video, but I've kind of gravitated to shooting stuff for uh, for for the models. Uh, I shoot stills for the models now, uh, but uh, but. You know, it's kind of it, the base. The idea is, is it's the data is crowdsourced, 
and GLSPS is providing and managing the database. And uh, what we are looking to do is put the models and the source images uh, into a database that would be a uh, secure database backed up. And, and, you know, our goal is, is to make this a permanent thing or, or something that, you know, outlives GLSBS. And I think eventually, um, you know, you know, nonprofits don't last <clears throat> forever. Um, but hopefully the, this <clears throat> fruit of our labors will. <clears throat> well, and Ken, these ships are not going to look like this in five years. This is so well, important yeah. to be capturing these. And so many divers are going and taking video of wrecks, and that video could all be used to create models and put them up here. Uh, this is just an amazing opportunity. C correct. It, yeah, it's, uh, while we're talking, I'll, this is this is an animation or a video of the the J H Jones that uh, we found in 2018. <clears throat> yeah, so so the the neat thing about it is you can you shoot the you shoot the uh, make a model shoot the video or stills make a model one year, and then you go back to it in some uh, next year or some other amount of time, and you reshoot it and because they're both digital images, we can do a digital difference. So, and, you know, uh, <clears throat> Tammy and Caitlin, you know, Tammy, Tamara Thompson and Caitlin Zant wrote a paper on d how to do this differencing. And uh, you should be able to sense like a three inch shift. So like, you know, if your deck or your cabin starts sagging or, the, or the side of the ship starts bending out, we should be able to detect that kind of thing. And, you know, the the shallow water wrecks, uh, I've always been amazed how how active an environment that is. And so, um, you know, I think it's important, we'll, we'll hopefully be able to understand a little more about what Deter causes the deterioration or shipwrecks and how fast they're deteriorating. So, you know, people will be able to visit these wrecks in the comfort of their living room, or they can, you know, professionals or students um, will be able to see a lot of shipwrecks. Let's say, you know, a student is studying um, double expansion steam engines or you know, Woodstock anchors. Well, you'd be able to go look at uh, hundreds, maybe a thousand shipwrecks and evaluate, you know, which ones had them, maybe how, where they were put, how they were used, whatever. Um, but they'll be, be able to quickly uh, identify, you know, you know, historical features on the wreck. And that you also, if you do it over time, they'll be able to understand you know, how at risk the site is, it, you know, if it's deteriorating and, you know, that, you know, that information hopefully can lead to mitigation efforts. I mean, whether it's, whether you go down and, you know, remove something because it's going to, you know, be obliterated anyways. It's, it's kind of like on Hamilton Scourge, you know, uh, you know, I applaud the idea to leave stuff on shipwrecks generally, but you know, they left the uh, muskets in the uh, in the cabins of the uh, Hamilton, and now with the uh, zebra mussels or quagga mussels, that's creating a, an acidic environment, and the the muskets are deteriorating. And and uh, you know, you know, at some point, it probably makes more sense to bring them up and preserve them, or bring at least a, a, a an example, you know, up and preserve it correctly. So, so I think, you know, they'll, you know, the information is there for people to make decisions on what makes sense for managing the shipwrecks in the future. And I think personally, I think this is the, to me, the biggest contribution we as a diving community can make to preserving our shipwrecks and, and, uh, you know, helping people enjoy them. You know, so and you know, a, a charter operator can put these on his website, and you know, people get to see what 
they're going to go dive. Um, you know, you can annotate these things and, you know, say what certain features are. So, you know, you can, there can be some education value to, to them. Um, so, so anyways, uh, yeah, we're, we, you know, our goal is to partner with, with, uh, like say different, uh, divers, professionals, and, and, and frankly, we want to do the shoreline wrecks too, you know, so it isn't just underwater stuff. Uh, I actually did the, uh, the, uh, Lottie, uh, Lottie Cooper, um, because that's, you know, deteriorating too. And that's, you know, that's onshore in Sheboygan and, uh, you know, you know, there, there was a, you know, discussion about what are we going to do with this thing? Because we're afraid it's going to fall down kind of thing. So I think, you know, even the stuff that's uh, shoreline is worth preserving. And, you know, there's hundreds of, you know, shallow water wrecks in the Great Lakes and they're easy to do. And, and I think there's certainly value in doing all of them. And so, so that's kind of, you know, that's kind of the, yeah, I know, Ken, uh, one of the big things that we were able to do was we found the industry. Um, the industry was owned by the Rowan uh, Salvage Company, and uh, John Rowan Asher, the grandson of John Rowan, you know, he grew up uh, playing on that boat, on that ship before it was lost. And, you know, he expected when I, I called him and told him we found his boat, and uh, he expected us to show him some blurry dive video. And we were able to send him a 3D photogrammetry model, and his jaw dropped. He was almost in tears. He couldn't believe that. Not only did we find his ship after all these years, but uh, that he was actually able to to physically almost go into the cabin. Uh, it yeah. was a, just an well, amazing can, experience. Can, uh, can you see this? I, I can't see my picture there. Can you see this? You can now. Yeah. So you can actually 3D print these. You know, you can export a, a style or STL file, and you can 3D print them. Becky, I think Becky will probably talk about this next week she's she's become a, a master at this i've got a kind of a cheap printer but uh uh so it's uh it's kind of fun uh wow i, I, I hope to uh print one out of the jh jones i printed a little one out um and uh i'm gonna print it a little bit larger but the uh, great great grandson of the captain crawford captain john crawford that who died on the J.H. Jones, his great grandson kind of, uh, he asked us to hunt for it and kind of inspired us to do it. And, and, uh, so it was kind of a nice connection to meet him and his father, um, and to be able to find the uh, J.H. Jones for them. And, uh, they, he has a, the picture of the one that's on the screen now, He's got a picture for his office of that, but I, I want to print out a a, a model. These, I printed these in white and then airbrushed them. But uh, so I think, I, and and these these will work. You know, these will make, work well for museum uh, displays too. So definitely. Well, and the other really neat thing is if you have VR glasses, you can you can walk through the shipwrecks in virtual reality and wow. we did that uh, uh, on the Strathmore and it was amazing uh, it was really fun to, to do you reach that. out and touch it you're walking through excuse me you could almost like you'd reach out and touch it it's a reality VR, virtual reality experience you're oh, there oh, yeah. well we had talked um, let me uh, uh, yeah, so, why don't you show us some of the stuff, Ken? I'll uh, kind of hide you here again. Yeah, so so I, this one I was most of my preloaded. I forgot to do this one. So there's there's um, you can you can access the models in different ways. You know, we have them all listed in th as thumbnails, or you can go into the lake, uh, and uh, you know these are the wrecks in the lakes that we have now. Uh, let me grab the. Uh, uh, Strathmore, so uh, that's in Lake Superior, and uh, it's it's up here. So that's the thing is, you know, the Strathmore is out on Mishpacoten Island, which is you know way out in the Tuileys. You know, <laughs> it's uh, 
it's a long way from uh, from anything, and uh, so it's uh, it takes it takes a little bit to load this, but but uh, when we're circumnavigating Lake Superior, um, Jerry had mentioned that this was a twin screw ship, and uh, and you know you don't see many twin screw ships, and it's it's in shallow water. This is like thirty foot deep, and the engines comes up within five foot of the surface. So you can imagine how the waves and storms have beat this thing. But when I dove it, I couldn't believe it. So I don't know if you, if you know much about engines, but when I looked at it, it was like, so this is the, this is the cylinder for one, one side, one propeller. And this is the cylinder for the other, but look at the difference in size. Can you zoom it in? Yeah. So typically, is that you can still see that? All right. It's not zooming. I'm just seeing the. Uh, you might have to reshare because I'm only seeing the the base screen. You know the the, the picture from. I'm oh. not seeing it zooming. Oh, you know what happened is uh, yeah, you're right. Um, okay, I have to. Uh, uh, yeah, I got to reshare this because it came up in a different window. Yeah, um, exactly. Go ahead and bring it up and then I'll share it. Yeah, but this is a, a, just a stunning example, this rack. Okay. So my, my apologies here. All right, what's it doing here? All right. So that I can see it in the lower corner. Keep trying, keep get it, get it shared, and I'll uh, bring it back up when it comes on. It's um, I'm not getting the share window here. Let me uh, unshare this this screen, and you can reshare because I think it'll. I think it doesn't want to share two at a time for you. So now go ahead and reshare, Ken. Okay. Here we go. There we go. Uh, okay. Let me go. And there. How's how's that? Okay. Oh, perfect. All right. This is what we wanted. Okay. All right. So okay, let me minimize you so people can see this. Look at that. Wow. Yeah. Go ahead and pan it around a little. Okay. So, so in your normal, you know, double or triple expansion engine, you're, you have a high pressure cylinder and a low pressure cylinder, or high, low, medium, and low. So, it was strange. I don't, I, this is a very unusual uh, uh, configuration to have two, a twin screw, two engines, and have a high pressure on one and a medium pressure on the other or low pressure on the other. So it looked like they were, this is called compounding. So the steam comes in through the high pressure cylinder and then it vents out and it goes into the low pressure cylinder and they typically do that on single screw uh, vessels uh, but you know they're both hooked to the same shaft and all the, the the valving and everything is controlled by one shaft but now but now here they've got the the engines separated they're compounding so these two have to stay in sync you know i mean I, i'm an engineer so this all <laughs> brings up lots of questions to me it's like and you know so you know and like here on the side this i believe is the uh the air pump which is kind of the condenser uh and if you look at this there's only like one you know, one air pump for the two engines. So it definitely looks like this thing has been, is compounded. So, so that brings up a lot of questions like, you know, could they run one screw at a time or one in forward and one in reverse, you know, because you couldn't run the, the starboard engine without having the steam pass through the port engine. So, you know, was there a bypass here? How did, you know, it brings out all kinds of questions and and i thought boy what you really need to be able to do is spend a lot of time putting this puzzle together you know and now with a 3d model 
you can actually, you know, start looking at, yeah, all right, so this piece went here and maybe, you know, uh, go through some things like that. Um, because this thing's not going to be around very long. Uh, well, you know, and it's been around for over 100 years. So, I mean, there's we got that going for us. But, uh, but like I say, from the top of the engine to the surface, it's only about five foot. So it's in 30 foot of water. It's in a bay. But, uh, you know, we shot this, the images over two years. We were there in 2016. And we Jerry tried to put a put make it into a model and didn't work very good. We had a lot of gaps. So we went back in 2017 and I reshot it. Well, what happened was we discovered that I think it was this boiler, one of the two boilers moved. I think it was this one. You can see this seam here yeah. because the boiler actually moved in the meantime. And so we had, you know, one part of the image was from one year and part of the image was from the other. So, so, uh, so yeah. And these, like say these shallow water, um, shallow water shipwrecks are very dynamic environments. So, um, so anyways, I, this one, I say I, this, I felt was important to document because I'm hoping that, you know, some archaeologist is going to look at this and go, "Holy mackerel! We need to, we need to study this. You know, we need to uh, document this because this is probably a one of a kind thing. I, I I've never seen another amazing. one like this. No, oh, it's just amazing, Ken. Um, are there any wrecks that you've ever been able to uh, go, go inside of and actually uh, do photogrammetry on an interior? Yes. Um, okay. No. <laughs> Let's see. Um, let's try something here, Brendan. Let's let's try sharing my desktop. Sure. Here. Okay. Just a second here. Let me um, let me queue up all of these. Um, um, I've got. I've queued these up. Ken, while you do that, I'm just going to answer a couple of questions. Sure. Uh, a couple of people had asked what the thing was powered by. This would have been a coal-fired vessel because it's it's a later vessel. This wrecked in 1906, so those boilers were coal-fired. Um, this is uh, the Strathmore. I can't remember what her name was. Darn it. Uh, she, had, she was just renamed, and she burned, which is why you see fairly little here. But this is such an important such a document because who's going to get out to Mishapakatan Island, you know? Um, not too Brandon, many. can you un unshare me again so I can reshare? Got it. Sorry, you are unshared. Okay. Okay, we're ready to bring yours up. Okay. And I'm gonna hide you again. Are we? All right, good. We're tunneling. We're, we're in good tunneling. shape. Okay, oh, folks, it's a schooner. Okay. Um, so this isn't one of them that I went inside, but while we're here. This is the Silver Lake. Um, this is um, this is a, uh, a, a scow schooner. It has this nice flat stern and big rudder, flat bottom. This is in Lake Michigan, and this one I did not shoot as a as a photogrammetry thing. I just shot this one. This was repurposed, and uh, you know I. The masts are kind of tough to do. That's <laughs> yeah, swimming up there. But uh, but actually, this came out. I mean, pretty good for uh, for uh, you know the you know just using repurposed video. It's amazing. Yeah, I, this is that's one of my favorites here. Now let me just close this one and uh, <laughs> all right, this one. All right, this one, this is the Russia, and Jerry did this one. And uh, so John Scholes and John Jansen, we found this one in 2019 in 210 foot of water up near Detroit, Detour Passage. And John Jansen and John Scholes shot the video for us. Uh, Jansen went down the port side and Scholes went down the starboard side. And they went down and back, and I, I don't remember if they did that again. If we had four passes or, or just, 
uh, well, it had been four, roughly four passes anyways. And, uh, and this is, you know, this, Jerry just did a beautiful job on this. This is just amazing. Now, I, I, there's this one is also very unique, not from the fact that it's a, uh, uh, you know, this is a steamer, uh, kind of a, a package steamer. Um, but from what's inside, and unfortunately, we don't have the inside of this. We, this is one we want to go back and do. But this has two steeple compound engines. This is a twin screw boat. You can see the two propellers here. Yep. So it's a twin screw boat, and it has two steeple compound engines inside of an engine room. Now, you know, steeple compound engines are, I won't say they're rare, but they're, they're not real common. That means the pistons are stacked on top of each other. Uh, the, you know, they're, they're, it's compounded. They have a high pressure and then the high pressure cylinder vents to the low pressure below it. So they go in sync and uh, they're a somewhat unique engine. They're very tall because the engines are, are or the cylinders are stacked. There's no, to my knowledge, no shipwreck in the Great Lakes that has an intact engine room where you can see how the that engine filled the engine room. And this one does. This is not only has one, it has two. And the the engines go from the you know from below deck all the way to the ceiling of the uh, of the engine room, and there's a little cutout. It actually protrudes above the engine room. John Scholes swam in. You got to swim in through this and over this pile of junk here. And actually, today I tried to. He he was in there for just a couple of minutes, and uh, I tried. I thought, geez, it'd be nice if we could just get a a uh, model of that interior, but uh, it didn't work. So so, anyways, this is on the list to go to do. So uh, okay, so that's the Russia. Um, now let's see here. Let me get the one year we've done that one. Um, this is the Jones. Uh, where's here? It is. Okay, this is the one you were you were alluding to. So this is. Okay, I'm going to put this up at uh, full screen. All right, you see this? Okay. Yeah, it's the industry. It looks great. Yeah. So this is this is the the barge that that uh, Brendan, <laughs> Brendan gave me coordinates or what did I say? They're within a hundred foot. So, <laughs> yeah, basically I, I, I figured out where it was through um, uh, some um, wizardry um, there to, to, in full disclosure interest. There was a recent survey and they had it, uh, gone over an anomaly and it was available in the raw NOAA data. And uh, so I said, Ken, you need to go look at that. <laughs> and it was, and, and I thought it was the industry and indeed it was. Yeah. And, and you can actually read the name on the back here. So, all right, now this is kind of cool. Um, so now I ducked in to the cabins and, uh, and I went, I've actually uploaded this one again, Brendan, cause I took the globs out. There's still a lot of artifacts in here. But uh, yeah, you're virus free, just in case you don't see that. I'm oh, <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> and, what a nuisance those things are. <laughs> anyway, anyway, so these this we're inside the thing now. Wow. And, and uh, this is this is a generator here. That's the radiator. Um, and then you move over here, and here's the the toilet. Uh, and there we didn't I didn't get back in that area. So I just kind of made this is just one kind of quick loop I made uh, around and let's see if I can get it to turn around in here. Um, and that ships in 80 feet of water, correct? Right, something like that. It's it's very diveable. It was actually quite a challenge to do it because we had a lot of the visibility was not tremendous. Uh, we had a lot of surface light and so it was uh, it it was a challenge to get it all to to work. I spent a lot of hours fixing this one up. I don't I can't remember what this is. Some kind of a a motor winch here or something. I yeah. don't know what it is. But anyways, this is yeah. So you can go inside. 
Uh, I was going to, I forgot to do that one too. I was going to upload the defiant, which is the other one that we can go inside of. So our goal this year is to get to whitefish and do the, um, the uh, Samuel Mather engine room because I, that one to me is, has always been a favorite and just an amazing, you know, they didn't build those wooden bulk freighters for many years, well, maybe 20 years. And, but there's a lot of them. I mean, well, there's a lot of wooden bulk carriers, but, uh, but uh, the Mather, Samuel Mather at Whitefish has got to be one of the most intact. And, and the engine room, you know, we have one on the North Shore called the Hesper, and it's kind of filet of shipwreck. And uh, for years, I dove that, trying to imagine what it was like, how to put it together, you know, and, you know, what each one of these things that I was seeing on the sides was. And, and then we dove the Mather, and it was a holy shit moment when I went in that gangway and said, this is unbelievable mm -hmm. to see a totally intact engine room, you know, the, the cruise quarters, the bunks, uh, the side rooms, tool rooms. Um, to me, it was just a, a aha moment, unbelievable. So, uh, so yeah, it was pretty neat. And, uh, and I've always wanted to share that experience. And uh, I think if we do it right, you'll be able to go in with virtual reality and, and actually experience that engine room. So uh, that's, Excellent. that's my goal. I want to do that with the Russia too. It's not quite as big a task, but it is deeper. Okay, so, we're coming up on time. Uh, I'm happy to run over a little bit if you had one more you wanted to show. Well, let's see here. Okay, well, this, okay, so here, I, I like this one. Um, uh, this is another one that was repurposed um, video. Um, this is the comet. This is in Lake Ontario. And uh, wow. It, what are it's those in like, beams. Huh? Double walking beams. Th this is the only intact double walking beam to my knowledge. So there's there's three very intact uh, side wheelers in the lakes. Uh, three very intact that are not buried uh, in the Great Lakes. Um, the Comet, uh, they, they all have kind of neat features. The Comet is the only double walking beam uh, uh, system. Uh, the cabins are gone on almost all of them. Uh, the, so there's the Comet, there's the Detroit, and then there's the Keystone State. And uh, this one, like I say, this has the double walking beam um, while we're here. And this, and this is in uh, Kingston, Ontario. I want to show you. So I'm working on this one. And this one is a challenge. This is the Keystone State. Uh, this is Dave Trotter found this. And it is the biggest. Uh, this, um, so it's in 150 foot of water. And the top of this A-frame is 99 feet. So this is 50 feet off the bottom. And giant 30 foot wheels. Um, it, it's interesting that the boilers on these things are, uh, are like 40 foot long. You know, they go from here boilers. all the way back to the, to the engine, you know, that's all boiler. So I'd never seen that before. And, uh, but th again, this was repurposed. There's, uh, we had a lot of surface lights, which gives you a lot of this water artifact around the wheels and that kind of stuff. I, I'm hoping to get back there maybe this year. Uh, it's, it's 30 miles offshore, so it's a long haul out, and it's and it's a fairly big site. So this one is this is in meta shape right now. I, I, this is when I say I've probably put 100 hours in this, and I've restarted it about tw 20 times. I, you know, adjust photos and and mask stuff and everything, and and try it and yeah this part gets better and this part gets worse <laughs> so yeah. well so. it's a fascinating sight can i wish you the best of luck in uh in recapturing that one um we're at about uh six minutes after so we run over okay. but uh this has been just amazing stuff ken and uh 
uh, particularly for our guests that have asked about it, you know, this is, uh, I think, uh, you've kind of been mind blowing. It certainly has been for me. Thanks so much for, for coming and walking us through this and especially for showing us the site and the models and, and the vision for what you're trying to do, because this is extremely important. Uh, people have already been asking for how they can contribute, you know, their, their videos and how they can maybe even make their own models and contribute them to the project. And um, I think I know Ken is uh, starting to come up with a framework for that and some, you know, documentation. So the permission things so that he can take in other people's work and show it that's in process with the group. But um, if you have questions about that, join us in the Zoom room. The Zoom room is going to be at 830 Central. That's 930 Eastern. Um, so please come and join us with that for, for that tonight if you have questions. Um, Ken, um, anything before we wrap up? Um, no, uh, I just reinforce what you said is we are, you know, when you start something like this up, it's, I described it as a centipede. There's a hundred legs to drill down to figure out what to do, how to do it. And uh, so we rolled it out slowly last year uh, with one partner, uh, Jeremy Bannister from Lake Erie. And uh, now, um, you know, we've got some more people interested. Tori Galloway just gave us... Uh, like half a dozen uh, recs to add. So, you know, we want to make sure that your intellectual property is protected and so that, you know, so that people will be willing to do that. And and so we're working out the legal agreements and database size and, you know, costs and how we back it up, stand, digital standards, uh, all that stuff. It's just a, a lot of things to work out. Uh, but like Brendan said, the wrecks are deteriorating every year. So it's important for us to get started on this. We do a hundred, I figure there's about a thousand wrecks that are not under, uh, you know, federal or, you know, National Park Service, NOAA, Parks Canada, under some federal uh you know operation that will do that you know yeah but there but there's like around 1200 uh, i think 12 around 1200 shipwrecks uh, in the great lakes diveable that we know about um so that leaves probably a thousand uh and if we do 100 a year that's 10 years to get through the first cut so you know. um uh so this is a it's a long-term project and uh we we are serious about trying to do them all and you know not us but you and us and i and like I say we believe there's enough goodwill in the uh in the diving community to uh to make this happen and i like say i think it's one of the biggest contributions we as divers can make to preserving the wrecks now so i couldn't agree more ken thanks so much for doing this and thank you everybody who joined us for the show tonight uh, join us in the Zoom room, and uh, don't forget to join us next week for uh, Becky Kagan's shot. Good night, everybody. Good night.